Hello, everybody. Trust you are all enjoying being part of Pinnacle Virtual Conference so far. Welcome to this session. I am Krishna Swami Subarao, Head of Product Management, Infosys Pinnacle, and I have the privilege of moderating the discussion today. Let me just set a quick context. We are living in unusual times. Multiple years of pandemic had made simple processes extremely complex. A simple family day note experience the other day turned to be a nightmare for me. The process was dated with so much of protocols, I decided not to venture out till pandemic is over. Imagine what is going to happen in already complex processes like transaction banking. Transaction banking landscape is challenging. There is always an evolving customer expectation, technology disruption, and competition threat, both from known and unknowns. To top it, COVID has induced economic contraction, which has threatened the business prospect of many customers. What banks are doing to counter this? Banks are redefining the operating model as well as creating the new models. These models involve smart business processes, newer platforms, and augmented workforce, both real and virtual, human as well as machines. In today's session, we will discuss contemporary topics that are reshaping transaction banking operating models for good. We will learn how leading banks are leveraging the power of modern technologies and purpose-driven culture. And for this, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce you to our eminent group of panelists, Peter Jameson, Managing Director, Head of Trade and Supply Chain Finance, Asia Pacific, Bank of America, Bhavna Sarov, Managing Director, Head of Trade, Working Capital and ECA Solutions, Lloyds Banking Group, Shekhar Bandari, President and Global Head of Transaction Banking, Kodak Bank. Panelists, thank you for taking your time for these panel discussions. Without further ado, let us start the session. My first three questions are about how your bank is helping your corporate customers during this crisis time. Peter, my question, first question is for you. The pandemic has forced companies to rethink and adopt different strategies, from supply chains to digital operations, remote working practices, and more. Can you please share us what measures your bank took to help your business customers during the peak of pandemic, and subsequently, how it has been tailored for the emerging market dynamics? Simply put, how do you think it is going to stand out in 2021, knowing that you know disruption in global supply chain is going to continue? Yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I think the overriding priority as we have adapted has been to enable our clients to operate whilst keeping their teams safe. And I think it's fair to say that that was the, the, the overarching uh, priority. Um, as I look at that, I think I would split it into two main components. First of all, digitization and then flexibility. On digitalization, uh, our focus really was on supporting them to onboard to digital platforms, um, in most cases, existing ones that we already had, uh, but also being flexible around other requirements. Things particularly in the trade space, like physical documents, company stamps, ensuring they could continue to operate within what was required, but in a way that ensured that they, their suppliers and their customers, and we as a bank remained adequately pr uh, protected throughout. And I think the second thing then was flexibility. Um, times of stress, particularly around liquidity and that desire to keep uh, the wheels of, of trade going. So for example, things like supply chain finance as, as a key tool that we found extremely impactful for, for our clients. First, as they saw that China supply side shock, um, and then in other markets as the demand side impact of the pandemic tracked through. So really digitalization and flexibility were the two key things. On your question around the emerging market, you know, I think it's fair to say that that uh, many of those markets are less automated and, and more paper-based. So to that extent, um, there were perhaps some more short-term challenges, but but longer-term opportunity from, from digitalizing some of that. Um, one of the key areas of focus for us was to see how we could support those processes for clients in the emerging markets in a digital or virtual environment, while still making sure that everybody could comply with, with regulatory expectations. And then finally, on your point about how that might pan out this year. I think 2020 was very much a year for immediate and contingency solutions. 
I think as we move through 2021, I expect to see clients look to embed some of those learnings more in their core processes. I think we'll see a lot more openness this year to the adoption of digital channels. Um, and whilst most of our clients use them already, there have still been some historical pockets of, of resistance. And the pandemic has reinforced the importance of these for ensuring business continuity. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your clear answer. I think digitization and flexibility are the two mantras which is going to drive the global transaction banking. My next question is for Bauna. Uh, although we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel, the pandemic is not yet over by any stretch of imagination. The new waves of COVID-19 has disrupted the plans to reopen economy. This has added more pressure on businesses and SMEs. As businesses aim to build resilience, primary focus will be on cash flows, working capital, and risk management. I would like to hear views on what strategies have worked for your banks to help your clients, help your customers in such continued difficult times. Hi, good morning, first of all, to everyone, and thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to an insightful discussion today. But to specifically answer to the question that you've posed, um, I mean, Lloyd's has got 40% um, market share when it comes to, you know, companies in UK um, through the retail bank. So it provides us a real captive opportunity to add value to this sort of client base um, and the small and medium sized companies, especially the companies with a turnover of anything between a couple of million uh, sterling to about 10 million. And this is a sort of a target market that has really felt the worst impact of, of COVID because they rely on the cash flow, they rely on liquidity to you know, facilitate their businesses. As you may know that in UK, there were two um, uh, um, sort of programs that were launched. They were called the C-Bills program. Um, and this was really targeted at enabling liquidity and sort of loans in, in a really accelerated way uh, to put this particular uh, target market. We had a digital version of that. And it just shows that, you know, technology is going to play such an important part of it. Uh, seven billion of uh, loans were underwritten within two days. Um, so, you know, two things I would say um, you have to do and what this COVID has taught us is firstly that, you know, liquidity, the access to liquidity has to be uh, made a lot more easier than the more archaic process of underwriting that the banks usually have. You know, when an SME comes to them, you know, we ask a lot, a lot of questions. Uh, you know, the process is very drawn, you know, you need security, et cetera. You know, it, it's not a process that is scalable, uh, nor something that really adds value and addresses the pain points that the clients ha have or had during this time. So I would say that, you know, uh, accessing the banking rails, but, you know, enabling some of those solutions in a more digital manner is, is something that would really add value uh, to these clients that we have. And we saw some good success uh, of, of that on there. And I think I just wanted to add to what James was talking about, you know, at least on a trade front, you know, none of everybody's um, so very well aware about, you know, 2 billion pieces of paper that keep shifting around in the, in the, on the globe for facilitating trade. You know, one of the things that is really accelerating uh, the, the, the journey on to digitization you know, we've got a lot of efforts going on around that. And I'm, if I get a chance, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as well. So digital and technology is going to be at the heart of a lot of efforts going forward. And a lot of investment is going towards um, that within the bank. Thank you, Bamona. Digital and technology are going to simplify the process of liquidity management. Very, very interesting to know. And, and I think it is the right thing for us to bring those reforms in the liquidity management because projects have become quite cumbersome, especially the paper part of it. Let me move on to Shekhar. Uh, Shekhar, even as the threat of pandemic moderates, the economic impact is definitely for real. And MSMEs are adopting and taking varied approaches to respond better, respond faster, and revive. Reflecting on your transaction banking strategies, how your bank has enabled your customers to navigate through these challenges in these tough times? Thank you. Uh... If I were to say Kotak Mahindra Bank uh, has been a pioneer in new technologies, uh, uh, charting new routes for the new world. And in the entire process, the uh, lockdown and the subsequent uncertainties which were created, uh, previously unknown challenges for our customers, 
uh, due to restriction in movement, reduction in collections and payments, restraints in document submissions, and an increase in transaction processing times. However, uh, the uncertainty gives you advantages or gives you opportunities. I think speed, innovation uh, became the two important words for us. And COVID-19 created a time machine, uh, I think of a sorts, one which helped us in especially creating three new journeys. I call journey number one, uh, the loan journey, where uh, you were able to digitize the entire document of lending uh, vis-a-vis the physical nature, which was uh, earlier. Uh, we reduced the 21-day uh, time cycle to on an average uh, uh, one and a half days uh, uh, for disbursement of MSME loans, which was given by the government uh, uh, during COVID times. You actually adopted an end-to-end -end paperless digital documentation through eSign, uh, which helped disbursement without any physical interaction. Um, we were always good with uh, opening new accounts with 811, and when the uh, uh, when the video KYC came in and when the entire country was locked down, uh, not a single employee on the field, um, we did realize that we were opening on an average 14,000 accounts every day. The 14,000 accounts getting open every day, uh, the bank continued to reimagine sales, services, and the processes. Same thing happened on the entire, uh, uh, the MSMEs, SMEs and the uh, large corporate segment where the entire paperless uh, 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 digital trade transactions started happening. So the customers which did not shift for almost uh, five to six years uh, moved during these times in uh, a couple of months to the pure digital process. And this was followed by, I think, speeding up the implementation of digitization of internal and external processes. Uh, with one or more process, uh, I think, uh, getting automated, digitized, and it resulted into a, a significant value addition through faster tags and a seamless documentation flow for the customers. Uh, to sum it all, uh, you realized uh, there were challenges in terms of working capital. Uh, support came from the government. Uh, there were challenges in terms of tags. Support came through digitization. Uh, there were challenges with respect to the credit worthiness and et cetera. The banks came forward and extended, um, along with the support of government, a significant um, uh, support to each one of those. As we see it now, I feel uh, things uh, come back to normal. Uh, the digitization part continues, and uh, something which was a time machine of sorts, actually, uh, uh, we are saying is a future of work uh, uh, for all of us. Thank you, Shekhar. This reminds me of a saying that, you know, there's an opportunity in every adversity. So COVID probably definitely has accelerated the process of digitization, exceptionally with respect to loan disbursement and other trade finance related things. Very nice to know that. Uh, coming back to Peter, being digital at core was the mantra even before the pandemic, correct? And what pandemic has done? Pandemic has only accelerated the processes. Factors such as digital technologies, new and nimble competition, empower and demanding customers, digital savvy customer, all of them are making new order for transaction banking. In this context, can you share your views on the important consideration specifically on how digital product engines are the key to the future transaction banking business success? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And, and my answer to that would be, it can't only be digital at the core. It's gotta be digital end-to-end, uh, -end, core, periphery, and, and, and everywhere. I think that should be our objective. Um, you know, I, I would bifurcate this in, into two parts as it relates to, to transaction banking. You know, the first part is the product engine and the importance and, and the evolution of that. And then the second part, probably specifically to trade, is um, how you create uh, interconnectivity in a, in a digital way, which is one of the key challenges for, for trade. You know, if I look first at the product engines, um, of course, it should be every bank's objective to digitize everything from the point that it, it hits the infrastructure to the point where it leaves at the other side, whether that be to a client or, or to a market infrastructure. And whilst that's imperative and a lot of effort, it's largely within the remit of, of, of each bank. Um, I think the bigger challenge is probably that we're looking uh, at how that operates very differently. That traditional message-based approach to how many of our infrastructures were built is really changing uh, over to, to more API-based or, or distributor le distributed ledger uh, type approach. 
you also have this requirement for always on, um, which goes right to the core of how banks infrastructure has operated for, for decades. Concepts like end of day, batch processes, downtime, um, you know, really fall very far short of what uh, consumer and, and corporate expectations are today. So, you know, whilst on the face of it, it, it it's relatively straightforward because it's within a bank's own environment, um, I think it's forcing a change in, in how we all look at that uh, digital core product engine. The second dimension, as I mentioned, is, is probably specific to, to, to trade, where the greater challenge is how do you digitize end to end? Um, once things leave your own infrastructure, and I think we're all familiar with, with how that's the big challenge for, uh, for, for the trade industry, given the cross-border multi-jurisdictional nature of the business and all of the, the players involved in a, in a transaction. Now, I think what the pandemic has done is shine a light on that, which is a positive thing, and the need to accelerate those efforts. I think the challenge, of course, is, is that going to be driven from, from top down? Or is it going to be a collection of local, regional, or, or global efforts that then ultimately get interconnected? Uh, because from my perspective, to create digital end-to-end, -end, not just within your own infrastructure, uh, comes back to some of those good old-fashioned things like standards, common approach, uh, and, and creating a network. So I think in summary, of course, digital should be at the core, not just at the core, uh, but I think we should aspire to get it right through each of our uh, infrastructures as well as the industry as a whole. I think the question in the case of trade on that industry piece is not the what, but the how. How do we drive that end-to-end -end digitization so that we can actually realize the benefits of our digital core? Thank you, Peter. I think that's a, that's a great answer. In fact, digital everywhere or digital anywhere is the important point rather than being digital at the core. Probably that brings me to the next question to Bauna as uh, Peter was talking about uh, while digital at core provides the foundation, I think transaction banking goes beyond that. Banks need to strive for delivering truly digital experiences. Given that two corporate customers don't have similar expectations, what are the strategies? What are the new possibilities? What are the new engagement experiences Lloyds Bank is delivering? Okay, so um, I think uh, we, we, we are definitely servicing a variety of client base here. And I would principally, just for the sake of answering this question, split them into two categories. So you have um, what we call an SMC sector, you know, clients, small, small customers, small turnover, you know, their needs are different. They want cash and they want it fast and quick, right? And then you have the sort of multinationals and, and large corporates, you know, multi-billion dollar companies what they their needs are slightly different you know they don't have issues with access to liquidity but what they don't their pain points lie around multi-bank solutions right so you know having to log on to you know they have bank relationships with you know 20 30 banks it's not possible for them to kind of log on to online portals of each of the banks so what they are looking for is like a one-to-many type of aggregator models where they hook into one place and then they get access to a much wider network of uh, of counterparties or, or um, you know solutions through that. So we're kind of addressing it, um, you know, along with like having a two pronged approach on that. Um, so for the SME side of things, it's all about you know, like I mentioned before, you know, bringing about that sort of ease and access to liquidity you know, bringing, using digital rails to be able to enable that. And we have very, uh, we've looked at our um, solutions and the sort of the journey, the word journey was used before. And, and I think um, what we have done is that we have co-created some of these opportunities and these, uh, these sort of solutions for our clients. We're no longer like looking at, we have to solve for everything or we have to find answers to everything. We kind of create uh, you know, workshops with our clients and, and create solutions that, you know, have, uh, you know, the real direct input from our clients so that we make sure that the solutions we bring about, you know, uh, there is a surety that they will meet the, the needs of it. The other thing what we're doing is that we are, we're stopping, we, we don't feel like all development has to come from within the bank. Bank is a financial institution. It's not a technology company. So we no longer carry the burden of finding the solution, the technical solution. We are really 
professing sort of the philosophy of partnerships and acquisitions wherever possible and you know outsourcing a lot of this work to the companies who have the USB for offering these solutions. So we, during the the right bang in the middle of pandemic, you know, we did a, a POC, uh, you know, with a couple of companies, right? And it was done within six weeks, which is unheard of usually in the banking, uh, I would say, uh, world, because usually when you're trying to do a technical solution, it, it needs investment rounds and things like to, to, to get it done. So I think uh, what I would say is that, you know, making sure that, you know, we are keeping clients at the heart of the journey and the solutions that we are creating. And then, you know, putting, uh, having a very, I would say, speedy go to market uh, and not trying to worry about, you know, what the end state of the solution would be, but doing POCs so that we at least know that our efforts are directed, you know, in, in the right direction is, is important for us. So that's the kind of the story around the SME side of things. But on the similarly on the sort of large corporate, I would say multinational companies, you know, again, you know, looking at, you know, you know, got a lot of blockchain solutions coming out. You've got Congo, you've got Contour, right? Which one should you be going for? You know, our clients are not Congo is just a commodity blockchain, right? It doesn't address the needs of, of some of the other industry uh, clients as well. So I think for us, it's really looking at, you know, what is the client base that we service? And you know, looking for scale rather than trying to plug into every island that is cropping up. But you know, it is really important for us that we get make sure that you know we get the biggest bang for the investment we are making. So driving it through, you know, having an understanding of the clients we are serving, uh, and then you know, directing our our efforts on, on it. There are like five principles that we uh, we are uh, we keep in our minds as we go about it. Is one that you know it's all about partnerships and acquisitions two it's all about co-creation with clients three is all about you know apis right and apis is the most wonderful thing i absolutely love uh you know wherever there's a possibility of using an api channel you know we want to go for it and i think a lot of time people use the api in the sort of concept of connectivity with the client, but we're seeing a lot of use of API just within the bank as well, I think as the information and data gets handed off. Um, four is about data, right? You know, how are we utilizing our data, you know, correctly or, or not? And, and the fifth one is, you know, it's been talked about the, the digitization journey. So, you know, we keep all these principles in our mind as we go across go through the journey of of our clients uh, you know as we look to kind of address the needs on the journey that our clients are going on so i think that's really what i would say um is, is keeping us you know on the on the right track thank you Anna, for the clear explanation and also to nice to know that you know there is different different strategies adopted for different customers on one extreme you have a semi for asking where is my cash can i get it yesterday on the other extreme you have corporates who are talking about how can you simplify my multi-bank transactional banking processes. Interesting and to, very nice to know about the five principles which we spoke about. Uh, let me move on to Shaker. Shaker, this is again taking back on the answer which Bhavna gave. Uh, all of them are around platform businesses, correct? The future is about platform businesses. And platform businesses is not easy to build. And I don't think you can build it alone with a company. What you need is a larger partner ecosystems. My question is, how do you think this is going to influence the success of transaction banking? Specifically, what's your bank, what's your approach towards platform-based journeys? Yeah, a very interesting uh, question. And I think 65% of the total uh, banking industries would be wanting to answer this and address this. But uh, transaction banking has been, I think, ever-evolving division. And with the current stage being the platformization in addition to digitization and digital products. Uh, I say, I think, use the platform thinking not just for technology, but also for transforming the business model. And that's where we are uh, uh, right now. And this requires a strong core application uh, equipped with new technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data. And our aim has always been to provide an integrated trade, cash, loan, FX, liquidity, platform, I think, to our customers. Easy to think, uh, I guess, difficult to execute. And that's what I think all our teams come in. And when you have a connected approach, even within the bank, and then you have partners which have to come 
from outside to make it. Uh, but to reach this aim, I think development have started and uh, we strongly believe that for individuals, we were able to create, create a platform. Uh, for non-individuals, you need to create a more robust platform with uh, AI, ML, and big data. And uh, if front and backend systems across the product suits are able to talk to each other, you are able to have a great uh, uh, CX layer for the customer, which uh, is what the need for non-individual so-called SMEs, MSMEs, large corporates, et cetera, is required. We also have been working with various fintechs to uh, on the new age solutions, um, which also developing an API based open banking system uh, in order to make us, I think, more agile and modular. But uh, I do understand that this requires uh, what do you have? Uh, what do you want to make? And uh, the journey from uh, what you have and where do you want to make is uh, requires a significant amount of work uh, by each one of us. But uh, I'm very happy. Uh, I think the way uh, things are evolving and the way the outlook on uh, the non-individual side is coming towards the platform thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Sikha. That's very interesting to know that, you know, how do you move from what you know to what you don't, what you don't know? And again, the platform what is very interesting and I'm very glad to know that, you know, everybody is talking about an API work today. That's very, very good. So let me come back to Peter. Peter, one of the side effects of the pandemic, which is going to stay for long, I think is remote working. I think it is for a year. Working for home and working from home, both are going to stay. But I do believe, I think you touched upon initially about that, the regulators in Asia are still insisting on a lot of physical documentation, exceptionally in terms of the trade finance processes. How do you think it is important for banks to bring in smart processes, which are paperless, have minimum human interactions, and how do you think regulators in Asia, will they be more receptive to such electronic documents and fully digitized processes? As a person who drove the digital first operations in transaction banking, what are your views on that? Yeah, look, I, I think it's critically important for, for banks to continue focusing on building out paperless solutions. You know, they, they say that often the best innovation comes out of out of war. And in some ways we're, we're, we're in a war at the minute against the virus. And I think what that's done is, is acted as a catalyst for a trend that was already there. Um, and I, I think you know, it behoves us as an industry to, to, um, to use that to build on, to drive towards this, this goal that we already had of, of smart paperless capabilities to, to, to ultimately support our clients. Um, you know, I think there are three dimensions of this for me. The first one is the immediate need. Um, I think it's becoming clear that the pandemic disruption is, is going to continue through large parts of, of 2021 um, and perhaps even longer, unfortunately, in some markets. So um, there's going to be a need there to continue to look at new ways of, of doing things. To go back to that key priority I stated of, of uh, keeping clients' business moving whilst keeping their team safe. Um, Secondly, as the pandemic subsides, I think we're going to see a lot of these new work practices become the norm, which is a good thing, uh, whether that be flexible working, clients location strategy, and the need for teams and businesses to be able to function without access to those usual uh, infrastructure items, whether it be in the case of trade, printers, copiers, postal infrastructure. Um, so this will become a more permanent fixture. And as such, we can't stop here. We have to keep developing those capabilities and, and adapting to that new need. And then thirdly, and, and, and finally, you know, I think the pandemic has raised another operational risk scenario. So regardless of future work posture, and hopefully we, we will get through this pandemic situation, I think companies will look increasingly at fully digital capabilities as a way of shielding themselves from future disruption, whatever that disruption might be, pandemic or, or, or something else. Um, on the point about the regulators, I think the simple answer is, is yes. We are seeing a lot of focus from regulators in Asia um, around this. Um, I, every market and jurisdiction has their own uh, practices, rules, regulations. Uh, the pandemic has certainly put many of those um, under the spotlight. There are a lot of Asian markets where governments have been heavily invested in, in digitalizing the economy already. I think this will provide a boost for them and, and also a vindication of their strategy. There are other jurisdictions where, where governments perhaps haven't been as active, and I think they will now recognize that this is an opportunity to relook at some of those 
uh, processes, whether it be requirements for, for stamps or, or physical paper, physical signature, and those sorts of things. And I think we will see, and we are seeing increased openness uh, to look at the legal, regulatory, and practical barriers. Um, of course, the, the, the challenge for trade is the degree to which countries adopt similar or consistent practices in a digitized world, because with our cross-border business, of course, that can multiply up the variables. But my hope is that the less sophisticated markets will look to the more sophisticated ones and, and seek to adopt some of those practices. So that in turn should create some, some harmony, which in turn, of course, will enable us as banks to continue building on, on these capabilities well into the future. Thank you, Peter. It's nice to know that you know, regulators are finally taking cognizance of these facts. Uh, let me do a small speech. Rather than asking Bhavana, I will go to Shekhar for our next question to show that you know we are all agile. Uh, Shekhar, this is again uh, talking about uh, inter-organization automation using black tech. And, and I think uh, both Bhavana and Peter did it earlier. The distributed ledger technologies are very much important to take forward the black tech strategy. I have seen examples of this in international trade, international payments. From your corporate customer experience, can you share your views on how this is likely to influence the dynamics of transaction banking? And are there any new possibilities it is going to unlock, specifically post pandemic? Yeah, I think let me just set the context with uh, what is the next normal for banking. And uh, that's when I come to the entire uh, distributed ledger technology as a thought. Security, resilience, being real time, self service, transparency, integrated, connected, and data driven empathetic ecosystem are, I call, the next normal. So the future of banking would be based on ease of access, open banking, data, security, and has to be supported by technologies, uh, AI, ML, and blockchain. Blockchain in particular, I've been very passionate about it for last uh, four years. And uh, what has happened during uh, last eight months have been uh, to make, I think, to expedite the entire piece probably by four, four to five years and to prepone the entire piece to make it drawing the attention of all the major banks across the globe and including us in order to create an enhanced customer experience. Uh, it makes transactions more secure, sure, while creating a transparent and tamper-proof history and more importantly, I think when you use a lot of physical documents. In India, domestically, as well as for international trade, you use a significant amount of uh, uh, physical documents. Same thing happens with most of the developing countries. Uh, even many developed countries have those challenges on the physical documents. India has come out with uh, um, uh, a trade and remittances solution uh, with a blockchain infrastructure company. Uh, special thanks to uh, process for um, supporting us on the technology side and thinking again ahead of the curve uh, because uh, BIC or the blockchain infrastructure company is a consortium of Indian banks exploring and implementing blockchain in uh, trade finance first and then move to other areas. The simple rule uh, is to reduce 180 pages to on an average uh, um, uh, 10 to 12 uh, pages, uh, seven days to on an average to less than a day. And there are a couple of uh, uh, steps which still need to be done physical, but I think 20 steps of physical to become two steps of physical. And when you combine all these at different banks, you generally feel that uh, what we thought of technology as an enabler actually becomes a reality um, the way we see it. I expect to be an Indian uh, example, and I'm very happy that as a bank and as an individual, one leads that space uh, with um, or the blockchain infrastructure company. Thank you. 180 to 10, 10 to 12 hours to one hour. Very, very interesting. And I'm very happy to note that, you know, our collaborative platform, which is helping us in this journey. My question, next question is for Bauna. Uh, again, continuing on the discussion of automation, I think banks are definitely going to explore new options in the form of industry utility based business processing. This brings together an ecosystem to perform a set of common non differentiating services. Do you see this gaining traction in transaction banking space? Specifically, what are the, some of the use cases which you think will work out well? 
to give some examples, maybe like KYC processors or document management, anything others which you think can incorporate the venture? Well, I, I think that, you know, firstly, you know, the space is so big in terms of the needs that need to be addressed that no one single bank can actually address that. Um, so I think there needs to be a sort of a cross industry collaboration, a lot of fronts for this to gain scale. And and trade has really been, I would say, at the archaic uh, end of the development process. So I think uh, now is a good time for us to to use uh, some of the experiences from from the pandemic to to accelerate that journey. Some of the use cases that we have looked at um, is uh, one um, around sort of fraud. So you know there's a lot of fraud associated with with trade documentation. It's because it's related to paper. A client, if they so wish to do that. Um, you know, they can present the same set of documents at one bank and then take the, 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 the same set and present it to another bank. So the banks usually fall victim to a, a lot of fraud that can be uh, perpetrated because of, of movement of paper. So one of the things that, you know, we are looking at, there is a company called a TIN. It stands for Trade Information Network. It's a collaboration of all the big global banks. Why? Um, you know, because they are the ones who are um, supporting the materiality of the trade flow. So you've got HSBC in there, you've got City in there, you've got Standard Chartered Bank and so on and so forth. And, and I think the purpose there is to say, you know, how can we, um, you know, uh, stem out, you know, the fraud, for example, in, in that exists within the, the sort of trade, uh, trade network. Uh, by giving visibility on, you know, the, the purchase orders that are getting financed, you kind of, it acts like a registry, right? Uh, I think a good analogy of this is like at you, in the U.S., you've got UCC filing. Once you, once you buy debt, you go and file uh, your claim on the debt and say, you know, I'm the owner of that debt. So if somebody else wants to finance, they first of all go and look at you know, uh, that you know, registry and see if that debt has, is owned by anybody else. So TIN kind of creates a similar registry information to say, you know, has that PO or that invoice being financed. So I think that kind of bringing together of the network to be able to um, address some of the pain points we have from an industry perspective is, is definitely going to be helpful. Um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about um, SWIFT, right? You know, SWIFT has a captive channel, um, you know, in terms of, you know, be, bringing the banks together. That already exists today. So how could we use some of that, you know, channel, uh, that channel to uh, facilitate movement of documents? So as you know that, you know, um, it's no, no, not good enough to just automate the internal processes at one bank. You have to have a, you need to do it across the industry for it to have an end-to-end -end digital experience. So what we have been working with SWIFT is on the file act where we have been able to do, uh, you know, exchange documents in a digital manner, not needing the reliance of the paper to kind of flow between the two banks to be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, manage the, the presentation of documents under a letter of credit. But again, it, you know, it was a, a piece of work that we did, uh, which is related to commodity clients, because, you know, they don't need original documents and, and bills of exchange, et cetera. So that works. So the other work that, you know, in terms of, you know, coming together as an industry uh, and, and working towards um, things that are not going to be sort of uh, sensitive from one institution to the other is looking at the standards. So we're working on uh, with uh, UK Law Commission to change uh, and, and find uh, ways to um, uh, look at the law on transferable documents that will further allow and expand some of the work that we did with SWIFT. Uh, and include uh, the, the transferable documents like negotiable instruments, bills of exchange, et cetera. So I think the point I'm making to you is that through these examples that, you know, not no one bank has to solve for all, no one bank can solve for all. It is really important that, you know, we come together on certain aspects like, you know, KYC, like fraud, like standards to kind of really build uh, build scale to the solutions that we are looking to individually and collectively pursue um, for, for the betterment of this industry.
Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I think that's very interesting to note. I think Peter was talking earlier about uh, wars driving innovations, pandemics driving innovation. Unfortunately, those innovations also happens in fraud in other spaces, correct? Uh, and as you rightly said that, you know, it's not like one bank. I think it's a consortium which needs to get together to make sure that, you know, these frauds will not happen and the uh, and corporates are safe. And it's also interesting to note that, you know, FIFT has taken a leadership role in this journey. Uh, let me move on to uh, Peter. Uh, again, uh, one more question on the new norm, remote working, definitely a new norm, correct? Uh, this has forced banks to change their operating models. What's your experience so far, specifically in the transaction banking services? What are your bank's plans to ensure that you know, staffs are well equipped with latest technologies, which is going to differentiate your organization from the rest in the market? Yeah, no, I think um, you know, if I look back at, at 2020, um, certainly there was a, a huge disruption to where our our, our teams um, you know, had to operate and and the setup um, and and the infrastructure that that they had available to them. Um, again, as I said, our priority from the outset was to to keep our teams safe and to to put things in place that would allow our clients to operate whilst whilst doing the same on their side and and keeping their team safe and I think on the whole it has worked extremely well and the reason I say that is that that we were fortunate to come from a position of of strength um you know for our operations teams uh, remote working um for the majority has been possible because of all of the work that has been done on digitizing processes um in the case of trade uh, whilst there's clearly still some physical handling of documents um, and a need for, for teams to be able to support that once they've been ingested into our bank systems as digital images or, or data, um, which initially was done for efficiency driver reasons. What we've actually found is that that means that our teams can pretty much do what they do anywhere. And that has been a real position of strength as we've uh, worked through this work from home posture in, in many uh, in many markets. Um, you know, of course, ensuring the teams are provided with the technology and set up to perform their functions is key. And, and we focused a lot on that so that people could operate effectively from alternate sites or, or from home. Um, but you know, the priority throughout has been to make sure that we can continue to meet the expectations of our clients, not least because this is exactly the time where they expect more from us in a stressed environment where movement of goods, paperwork and funds and liquidity uh, is so critical for them uh, given everything that, that's going on in the market. If I look to the future, um, I think in terms of whether remote working will become the norm once the pandemic has subsided, I think it's too early to say, and I think that will vary across industries and, and, and between countries. But what is clear to me is the need to retain the ability to be agile. Um, if we go back to the start of, of 2020, I don't think we could have foreseen what was going to happen. Um, and I think as we look forward, the ability to remain agile, because we don't know what's around the corner, uh, whether it be you know, another pandemic related disruption or, or something that we can't yet foresee. So I think it will be crucial as we think about our operating models to have the technology and planning in place, to have that digitization in place, which we were lucky enough to have have uh, done over the, the, the past years uh, to allow us to continue serving our clients seamlessly in, in, in that environment, w whatever happens in the future and whatever the work posture post pandemic will look like. Hey Peter, I think agile is the way forward. Agility is something which I think nobody can ignore at this point of time. Uh, let me move on to Bhavana. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, I think you know about Alan Turing test. Alan Turing test in is about the artificial intelligence and he introduced this in late 50s and what the test does it checks machines and humans and it checks the responses and a computer will pass the test if 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 a human is not able to differentiate the answer as coming from a machine now this has become reality correct the star wars and the matrix i don't i think all of them are going to be real soon so now my, my question is that you know going with so much of machine force augmenting the human force digital customers demanding a lot of self-service capabilities, digital equity advisory services, and so on. How do you think this blended workforce where machines are augmenting human, human capital evolve in transaction banking space? Maybe to put in a simple way, can we say in virtual RM nowadays? And if it's a virtual RM, I'm not sure whom I'm going to scold it. If my portfolio is not doing well, can I scold the RM or can I scold the machine? I don't know where it is going to head. What are your views on that? I think there's always going to be a place for humans in the equation. 
right? And it's all about uh, lifting that to uh, value add services, right? You know, the way, you know, um, I think Shekhar mentioned earlier uh, the word journey. We use that all the time, the customer journey. When you look at that customer journey, there are parts of that journey which are very process oriented, right? I think when you look at those journeys, it's important to say, okay, what a part of that journey can be outsourced to a machine, right? Because that's a repetitive task that can easily be done. And it's actually more efficient to do it, right? You know, if a client is looking for simply um, understanding where is my transaction, right? I mean, if you look at some of the things that during pandemic where we had a spike of inquiries, those inquiries were simply, I wanna know where's my transaction, right? Just like similar to like when you send a parcel into, um, you know, to a tracking system, all you need to do is enter your reference and it will tell you where your transaction is. So all that our client wanted to do was, you know, what is the transaction? Where is our transaction? So normally, how would they do it today? As you said, you gave an example of NRM. They will pick up the phone to NRM and say, can you please tell me where is my transaction? Now, is that a good use of a RM's time? I don't think so, right? So, you know, what we did is that, you know, we enabled, and I, like I said to you, I, you heard me talk about API. And, and to James's point, you know, as, as we sort of automate the underlying workflow and our processes, that will allow us to bring some of those, you know, uh, benefits of that to our clients. So, you know, that we created a trade tracker and all that it did does is that you input the transaction reference and, you know, you will know exactly where your transaction is. So I think um, the, the point here I'm making is that, you know, there's always a place for humans but there's definitely a lot that machines can help expedite that journey for our client's decision. Because like I said to you, what do clients want? They, they want the money, at least on the smaller end of the SMEs and MSMEs, right? They want it fast and quick. So if they can actually uh, reduce that journey from having to call somebody, you know, being, being successful or not in, able to connect with that to just simply typing a, a reference and knowing where the transaction is, I mean, to me, that's a better outcome for it. And, you know, like I said, you know, we talk to our clients and that's what we get told, you know, that, you know, they're, they're looking for a, a better user experience as well. So I feel like there's going to be a place for both, but I think uh, human intervention has to be elevated to more value-add, risk-based advisory sort of role versus, you know, doing the more repetitive, mechanical, uh, work and, and you know we are doing we're taking great strides in in Lloyd's in looking for example our sanctions journey right you know we we collect a lot of data we've got a lot of documents coming in you know why doesn't uh, a human you need a human being to be able to say yes we can do this transaction or it's a sanctions hit yes or no right so I think you know like I'm saying that there is going to be a place for humans but you know it'll be more on IP based advisory risk-based decisions more than you know you know, uh, the the mechanical and the more process driven side of things and i think i i firmly believe that you know we we have to use ai we have to use technology we have to use digitization to to kind of automate that that aspect of the journey thank you i think that's a, that's a great answer you clearly told me that you know don't don't ask your RM about where is your transaction. Ask an Alexa where is my transaction. Ask RM for more value added thing. And that's a great answer. Coming back to the last question of this session, this is for Shaker. Uh, hey, this is about one of the topics which we discussed at a lot. APIs. APIs were existing even during days of mainframe and many mini frames. In fact, I have used APIs long long ago. But what has become more relevant today with respect to open banking is that you know APIs have become irreplaceable. And also, we know banks are setting up API gateways to help clients to get an easy and quick access to their information and enable to perform transactions real time. I think it's going to be API world soon. So can you tell me about unique possibilities on API and how your bank is driving innovation on this space? And also probably what are the key expectations on that line? Because everybody talks about APIs. So uh, if I were to say um, open banking, uh, the new buzzwords and the API new buzzwords have been there and have been existing for time. Example, we have got 200 plus open banking partnerships uh, at the bank, which runs and which 
meets the expectations uh, of the client. And uh, it helps you to redesign the processes, promoting a more connected financial ecosystem, uh, which we have been emphasizing on. And by leveraging APIs, uh, the platforms and the cloud banks and delivering data-centric solutions, uh, you generally believe that I think uh, it is a real-time access to data and the decision-making processes, which you help the clients with. It also takes care of a lot of risks, which we have been, uh, I think, uh, looking at. Uh, we also even, I think, upgrading our API suite. So I think one is API suite, which is available. We think we are ahead of the curve, but uh, you still uh, think, given the client expectations um, uh, now, that you need to continuously upgrade it so that uh, even if you have got 200 uh, plus uh, uh, open banking partnerships, 170 odd APIs, uh, customers, I think which people use, uh, you still will provide easy and universal access to most of the products, uh, I think across the entire piece. But uh, you have to take care of privacy and security as a very important part when we develop uh, that piece. Our API suit, uh, which the customer's expectations have been, uh, have been around account services, I call balances, um, status, uh, Bhavna very well covered that thing, status of transaction, what my RM is doing, what can I do? Uh, the payments and collections, uh, which is transaction initiation, transaction approval. Um, uh, does it, can it happen 24 by seven rather than being limited only to the office hours when the uh, teams are there? Um, on the trade side, I think to have a few guarantee text and et cetera, I think if they want to even refer uh, MISs and et cetera, which they want to have or the reports uh, in order to just help them to manage the working capital uh, a bit better, a bit smarter. And with the aim of that, I think you want to create more value and convenience uh, for the customers. Uh, the data sharing part becomes, I think, very critical in the uh, entire ecosystem. And uh, uh, banks need to build, I think, connected, uh, even connectivity options called APIs uh, to cater to, I think, these needs. This is their own customer data, not, I think, you're taking it from someone else, but uh, you do we realize that when you have an exchanging data from the ERP or a finance system of the customer and account receivables, I think on the both the sides, you do uh, realize that uh, you have to take care of uh, the entire part on security as well, besides meeting uh, what customers want. But to sum up uh, all, I guess uh, uh, the open banking, the API infra is actually helping to redesign, I think the processes and promoting the more connected financial ecosystem. I think a quick time check. I think we have time for only one audience question. A lot of questions about fraud, API. There's one very interesting question. I think probably I will let anyone of you to answer this question. This is about culture. How important is for banks to propagate a culture shift with a strong focus on open and collaborative innovation? Is it the time for a culture reset in the banks? Any thoughts? Very, very, very important. I, I think you hit the nail. Um, I call the culture of uh, uh, thought, culture of trust. Uh, honesty, integrity, and all become very, very important even if we digitize the entire world. Uh, if you remember, I told something on the COVID-19 is creating a time machine and, uh, and one that is uh, taking um, uh, companies into the future of work. But uh, besides being agile, besides being adaptable, adaptable, and besides being, I think, able to uh, prioritize, I think, what has to be done, you do require uh, the thought, uh, the culture, and it starts from the top. Uh, and, uh, I expect, uh, I think, CEO to be uh, thinking digital. I expect uh, them to be understanding each of those risks and uh, uh, each of the employee which is doing on the ground, which he thinks that he has just approved a transaction or uh, a particular piece of data, how that data put together becomes a good information, how that information actually becomes a valuable uh, requirement for the customer to meet his working capital requirement smarter and in a better manner is where I think the culture part uh, comes in. Uh, at the institution, I think culture has been a thought uh, right from day one. I will say the same thing uh, with uh, Infosys. Uh, I think start from Mr. Narayan Murthy and the way he uh, had the culture part uh, got in, agility got in, and, uh, and that's where I think the organizations move forward. Okay, that's a great answer. Uh, which is quite close to my heart because I grew up in the culture of Infosys. I think with this, uh, we have come to end off in very great discussion. Big thank to all of you. We are very grateful for your time and valuable insights. 
and thank you all the attendees for making time to attend i do hope the session was useful and there was much you could take away from the discussion do feel free to come back and view the recording look out for the follow up email from my team with a video link feel free to share the same with your colleagues as well i hope you all stay tuned for finacle conclave and enjoy the high quality speakers and discussions lined up for you thank you all good day and stay safe thank you